Hi, I am Dr. John Strax, and I'm here in Chicago with my friend and colleague, Dr. Howard Schumanner. Most of you probably know who we are, but if not, I will introduce us. I am a physician here in Chicago, and I run the area's only mind-body medicine practice. I worked at Northwestern Hospital in Chicago for eight years and then opened up my current center in 2017. I see people for mind-body medicine consultations, and I run some of my own mind-body medicine groups. I do some individual work with people. And yes, I am able to work remotely as we switched to all telemedicine visits about six weeks ago. I do some primary care and integrative medicine and a lot of endocrinology as well. And we recently hired as a staff, a, a physical therapist to help out some of our patients as well. Uh, both Dr. Schubiner and I are medical advisors for Curable. I was there when Curable was first founded uh, five or six years ago, like we used to meet John and Eric and Laura periodically for breakfast as we would talk through the possibilities and how to get Curable launched. We started these Hope for Healing sessions a few weeks ago when COVID-19 hit as both Curable and I were searching for what we could do to provide extra guidance and information during this stressful, stressful time. And a number of you were here with me and my colleague, Jessica Dixon, two weeks ago. We talked about migraines and self-compassion and mindfulness meditation. And we're committed to continuing to provide new information and new strategies for you through the entirety of this COVID crisis and lockdown. I have known Dr. Howard Schubiner since I was a medical intern in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 2005, when I randomly called him up and told him I was interested in this work and recognized that he had just started a mind-body medicine program in the suburbs of Detroit. I didn't know it at the time, but I've come to find out that he's an incredibly accomplished physician and researcher. In his bio on his webpage, it said that he's authored over 60 research papers and books. Howard, is that like twice that, three times that now? How many oh. <laughs> papers? I, That's got to be more I'm, than that. I'm quoting 100, but you know, it's really padded, you know, like academics, you know, we just kind of, we publish the same thing over and over again, you know, it's, it's just, <laughs> it's a game. He, of course it is. Uh, he started the Mind Body Medicine program at Providence Hospital in Southfield, Michigan, uh, many years ago. Has been a mindfulness meditation instructor for three decades, I believe. Was a faculty member in both internal medicine and pediatrics for many, many years at Wayne State University in Detroit. And my favorite fact about him is that he's got a national award in <laughs> medical education that's named after him. He's been a tremendous friend and a mentor for 15 years now, and it's my delight to have him here with me tonight. Howard, did I leave anything out about Oh, him? yeah. <laughs> that was so kind, John. Well, yeah, I haven't talked to you in a, like a whole week now. I know, I know. That's good, yeah. I've written uh, a couple of books. I think that would be the... Yes, I mentioned that, but it was hidden behind all the oh, okay. 120 research papers that you have written. So anyways, we, we would like to do a few things tonight with you. Um, we'd like to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and managing mind-body medicine during this uh, stressful, stressful time. I was talking with a patient earlier today, and we were talking about kind of what's been happening with her condition since the lockdown down began. We we're talking about sort of her background and some of the responses that had been extinguished over time that are starting to resurface in terms of um, little ticks and strategies for just managing life. And we were talking about, um, and Howard, what you and I have talked about over time too, this idea of, of um, priming events and triggering events. So things that happen to us early in our life, oftentimes when we're little, and then events that happen in the present that kind of mimic what what's happened to us in the past. And so for, for her and for, for many of us, like grew up in chaotic households, and this is such a chaotic time for so many different reasons that it is clearly bringing up some of the 
old strategies that we don't use anymore that were incredibly adaptive at the time, but, um, but don't feel so good when we do them currently. And so we'd like to talk some about that. Um, like I said, Dr. Schubiner is a mindfulness meditation instructor. And so we'd like to talk a little bit about meditation and its role in managing symptoms in mind-body medicine, and a little bit about mind-body medicine and what's new in the field. Um, hopefully you have been leaving chat for us in the, um, in the curable feed so that we can see those and answer some questions for you. And we will do our best to get to everything that we are trying to get to tonight. Before we get started, just a couple of notes about nomenclature. Um, many of you know the work of Dr. John Sarno, both Dr. Schubiner and I. Um, I'm just going to call you Howard. So say please, that. please. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so both Howard and I trained with Dr. John Sarno in New York. So many of you have read his books and know that he was one of the first physicians in the 1980s and 1990s to really talk about this idea that uh, physical symptoms can have non-physical causes to them. And so he was the one who first coined the term uh, attention myositis syndrome or TMS, which is how I learned about this work many, many years ago. And because of that, because that's how I first learned about it, I often use that term TMS when I'm referring to mind-body medicine. I know that in curable circles, it's often called mind-body medicine. And Howard, what did you say you're calling it? You know, uh, I've, uh, it's, it's hard to have a great name because mm -hmm. it's, I'm trying to be very specific. When I think about the most proximate cause of when our brain causes symptoms in our body, mm -hmm. that's my, in my view, that's due to a neural circuit, a circuit in the brain that's been learned that turns on, mm -hmm. it can turn on, it, it can turn off. So mm -hmm. it can turn on a headache like migraine you talked about last week, it can turn mm -hmm. on back pain or stomach pain or anxiety or fatigue or insomnia. And so I sometimes, when I'm talking with my patients, say, well, this is a neural circuit problem, which distinguishes it from a physical problem or a damaged problem. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, you know, in, in a, it's like a software pro program, a software bug. Mm -hmm. You need to rewire the system, mm -hmm. uh, but you don't need to throw out the motherboard. So. Yeah. And, you know, you and I have we've talked about the topics we want to talk about. So I'm totally going off script like 10 seconds into your and my chat here. But I was talking with somebody earlier today about um, essentially learned associations. And so we're talking specifically about migraines and how they can get started either with different scents in her kitchen or when she takes a shower. And so we get symptoms in our bodies for lots of different reasons, right? We can get them because emotions are strong. We can get them because stress is high. That's what we're going to talk about in a minute in terms of COVID. We can get them because uh, current situations remind us of past situations or we've been through traumatic situations recently or in the distant past. But when people are having symptoms, simply because those symptoms have been learned over time, they are not, the shower isn't the cause of a migraine, but it's become associated um, with migraines. And how do you, when you're working with patients, explain to them this concept that symptoms can be simply learned and not necessarily due to any underlying uh, stress or, or emotion? And what can people do about it when, when that's the issue? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one of the most common things we deal with and one of the most fun things we deal with because it's often easily demonstrable. Um, everyone, not to compare us to animals, but everyone knows about Pavlov and his dogs mm -hmm. and that when, you know, the dogs, when he gave the dogs food and rang a buzzer, the dogs started to salivate when they heard the buzzer. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are mammals. We are animals in that sense. And we learn things. Our brains are constantly learning and integrating everything that happens in our life. And it's very easy for someone to develop this kind of conditioned response or learned association. And oftentimes it may be metaphoric. You know, it may have great meaning, but it may have no meaning at all. It may just be learned. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I like to do in that situation is if it's a shower, for example, is to have somebody uh, close their eyes and imagine getting in the shower mm -hmm. and see what happens. Mm -hmm. 
And oftentimes just that imagination will trigger their brain to create some sort of tension or anxiety or some symptoms or some mm -hmm. discomfort. Yeah. And when that happens, it's a great demonstration of these neural circuits that their brain has learned. Mm -hmm. And then that's a good entree into starting to rewire them, starting mm -hmm. to, to kind of look at that and recognize that and know that it's just the association. It's not actually the shower. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to have them um, uh, imagine going in the shower again, knowing that. Mm -hmm and do it a few more times. And pretty soon they can imagine going into a shower without getting that reaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the next step would be, uh, you know, reminding themselves that they are completely safe and not in danger mm -hmm. as they, uh, as they just even walk in the bathroom, you know, as they turn on the shower, you know, you can do it. You know, it's one of the mod one of the methods we've been using lately is graded exposure. So you're mm -hmm. just, giving them a little bit more and more exposure to uh, antecedent of the stimulus and eventually they can get in the shower and eventually they won't have it. And, and that's uh, that's a success. Yeah. Exposure therapy from yeah. cognitive behavioral therapy, sort of getting a sense that you can do these things. You can be in these situations without, um, without reacting in that way. And so oftentimes with CBT, we do it with depression and anxiety and here we're applying it for physical symptoms. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't necessarily have mean that one has to do deep emotional work or, or look for the hidden significance, you know, metaphorically, it may just be a, a learned response that can be uh, worked with. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So, um, so talking about the stress and talking about, COVID, it's clearly been such a disruptive time in terms of people getting sick, um, in terms of people having to quarantine, in terms of people losing jobs, being worried about income. And so there's been, I mean, obviously it's been top of people's mind for, for months now. And, and so one of the things that I have tried to do when I've talked with, with my own groups or groups of people that I'm with is to recognize that as bad as it is, there are pieces of it that aren't terrible at least, or sometimes are pretty good. And so when I've asked the question, what's been the hidden benefit for people of quarantine, almost everybody who I've talked to has had an answer to that. And so for me, one of the hidden benefits has been, um, there's no commute anymore. And so I have this extra time in my day that I've used for exercise or yoga, or because we're together as a family a lot, there's been more long walks with the dog than we would normally do. And I've, you know, running a, my own business during, um, during this time. And it's been a really nice exercise in uh, faith and um, making sure that like we can continue to do this even in hard times. And we haven't had to lay anybody off and people still need medical care. And we're doing our best to, to supply that for people and and do even more including talks like this and other um, resources of information that we're trying to push out so for you what's been a hidden benefit of quarantine for you for me um it's been that i've been taking walks and i just started with taking an hour and then an hour and a half and then two hour walks and it's just been heavenly mm -hmm to go out now with a mask, that's okay. And just be outside and watch the trees bloom and watch the flowers come out and listen to a book on, on Audible or just, just walk. And mm -hmm. I just felt just so much better being outside. Being mm -hmm. outside, being in nature is, is healing. Uh, another hidden benefit has been um, alcohol. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've had way more alcohol. <laughs> All of a sudden, it's like, oh, it's five o'clock or six o'clock. It's time for happy hour, and uh, and it's uh, it's nice. And uh, you know, I mean, alcohol is a double-edged sword, but um, uh, it has a positive benefit. And there's a rhythm that we've developed. My wife is working at home. I'm working from home, 
Mm -hmm. There's a rhythm we've developed, our coffee in the morning that we didn't used to do together and our happy hour in the evening that we didn't used to do together and our, and our cooking. So, and we've really reached out to so many people that we haven't seen in a long time to do mm -hmm. online, to do virtual dinner dates. And, uh, you know, so it's just been great to catch up with people we haven't seen in a long time. And then uh, this past weekend, we started our, our board, uh, online board games. Mm -hmm. So we had an online board game with our kids. Mm -hmm. We're planning Sunday night board games night. And that's just been, uh, you know, our family is spread out, <clears throat> like yours. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, we're using this time to connect as, as much as we can. That's great. I, you know, I have a cousin in Singapore, and um, I could Zoom him any time, right? But I never have. Right. Until now. And so Saturday night, he and his brother in Denver and I got on and caught up. And yeah, we just, we don't, we don't do that normally. And then yet, here we are. Anything else that you have found that has been helpful for dealing with the lockdown? Well, you know, we're going to talk about this a little more when we do the meditation or do a demonstration of that. But mm -hmm. I really think allowing feelings, you know, it's necessary to be angry sometimes. It's necessary to grieve. Uh, it's necessary to worry. I mean, none of those are bad things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I really, I really think it's important for people to understand that feelings aren't dangerous or harmful. That's part of our work that we do. Uh, and so helping people to have, well, one of my friends has a, He's got a 30 second rant that he does for his, for when he gets angry at whatever is going on that makes him angry. Um, and, you know, we've lost people and every, you know, I don't know if you're my age, you know, you know, and you're connected around the country, you know, people who've died or, you know, people who know people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, you know, people have been really sick and, you know, doctors and nurses who are going to the hospital and other, you know, the janitorial staff and the, food staff and the technicians are all going to the hospital every day, not knowing if they're going to get infected or not, and knowing that many of their colleagues have gotten infected. So there's mm -hmm. just obviously a lot of emotions. And I think it's just really important to have the, make the time and space to allow ourselves to just be with those and feel those and not be afraid and not have to push them down. Uh, but at the same time, know that, something good always comes out of adversity. Mm -hmm. There's never been adversity that something good hasn't come out of it. When you think about the, <clears throat> just in the past decade or so, the floods, the hurricanes, tornadoes, just so many amazingly devastating things that have happened. And every time there's some good that comes out of it as people connect, as people respond, as people unify, as people uh, help each other. So... So those are a couple of things that, that I try to um, emphasize and mm -hmm. talk to people about. Yeah, I think, you know, um, two weeks ago when we were out with Jessica, one of the things that I was saying is that it's been super helpful for my patients to be able to, to feel the feelings that go along with this. And I was talking to somebody earlier today, actually a staff meeting that we had saying that like in my house, like somebody is always melting down about something and we're just trying to let that be be okay. And whether it's just being mad at the certain situation or mad at each other, or <laughs> sorry that we missed this event or that event, like we're trying to allow those feelings to be present. And, uh, and what I said two weeks ago is that my, my mind body patients are good at that. And so I feel like in a lot of ways they are handling it like this community is handling that this a lot better than all people who don't know about this and people who are my patients who don't know about mind body medicine are calling me and saying like their backs out and they want some Vicodin and kind of that's how they're dealing with it. And so the more that we can recognize that um, those feelings are okay and natural, I think the better yeah. we all better off. And it's okay to laugh. It's okay yeah. to, it's okay to look at silly videos and parodies and all the stuff that's going around and social media, but that is just fun and people coping because you have to, you have to laugh. Yeah. And uh, one of the other things that was just amazing, it was actually in today, I think it was today's paper, 
Uh, there is an article talking about, well, you know what, maybe it's time to do some forgiveness work with some mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as times are like, in times like this, when there's mm -hmm. worry, yeah. and, you know, you don't know who, you know, what's going to happen, uh, you know, it's part of that reaching out can be reaching out to people that you've had difficulty with. And, yeah. and that can be a tremendous, tremendous benefit, obviously. Yeah. Despite all the stress, despite everything that's going on, some of my patients have been doing really well lately. Have you, A, are you able to see patients at the moment? I'm sure you're not in the hospital. Virtu virtual visits. Yeah. And do you have any <clears throat> nice stories of people doing well lately, despite the, the stress and the situation? You know, it's funny. I think most of my, most of my return patients have just mm -hmm. kind of, you know, they're just, they're on their own. <laughs> they haven't reached out, which I think is a great sign. Yeah. You know, it, I, you know they're doing okay. I mean, I'm, they would reach out if they were really struggling. Yeah. And most of them have not. So I've seen actually a lot of newer, new patients. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and a lot of times what happens is, is that when one thing occurs, other things can subside. In other words, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I can't, I remember I had one, woman who had a horrible, horrible, horrible foot pain, just horrible, just constant, ongoing, just so focused on it. And she went overseas and she got a sinus infection. All of a sudden her foot wasn't hurting so much. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so when, a, when, you know, when a coronavirus strikes, when there's a pandemic, there's something important to worry about. And maybe you kind of stop worrying about your back or your stomach, you know, things get better. Yeah. In another way, which is often very instructive. So I've seen yeah. people that have, have been up, have been down. Um, and so, and, but it really shows how, how neural circuitry works in action. It has, shows how the mind-body connection works in real life. When you see, you start worrying about something, and then the other thing's not, not really there. Yeah. And that's a diagnostic uh, tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a um, patient I talked to this morning who's doing quite well. Um, we talked about the fact that my patients who are introverted are handling this much better than my patients who are extroverted. And a number of my introverted patients have said they actually sort of like this idea that they can say, oh, I'd love to come over tonight, but... but yeah, <laughs> great excuse. <laughs> they don't have to feel badly about turning down social invitations on the weekends. Um, and the other thing that happened to her is that like she had all these other practitioners, chiropractic and Rolfer and physical therapist who she can't see at the moment. And so sort of as she's let those go, her physical condition has gotten <laughs> better and better yeah. uh, and better. Do you ever read the house of God when you were a medical resident? That was my Bible. It came out. I think it came out the year I was an intern. I think, so. I think that's true. <laughs> um, the, the patients for whom we do the most, nothing do the best. Right. Is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There. And it, you know, and so much of it really revolves around what your home life is like. It can be nice and a quiet refuge, mm -hmm. or it can be too quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Or you know, I, the guy I was talking to the other day, he's you know he's home with his kids. He's loving it. He's getting time to spend with his kids. Yeah. And then I've seen a bunch of moms who have you know two or three kids who are working from home and dealing with the kids at home and trying to teach them. Mm -hmm. And it's been really stressful. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's been really stressful. And, you know, certainly we've heard reports about domestic violence rising. And yes, so there are definitely those types of issues. Um, we have in our house, there has been a lot of family time and we're all a little bit on the introverted side. And so that's been okay. We just rented this nice, huge, gorgeous office on the north side of Chicago that um, no patient has been in in <laughs> five weeks now. Um, but we have used it as a schoolhouse because the Wi-Fi is great down here. And so the kids, I come down here almost every day for that reason. And the kids come down here with me frequently. I've got a seventh grader. And a, and a sophomore in high school. And so they frequently will do class from down here. And we have started instituting um, every week or every other week movie nights. And so we are slowly working our way through the, um, the Marvel Comics series, The Avengers. And so we've watched a few of those movies on the big screen TV that we were going to do your movie on before everybody. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so tell us about your movie. Uh, yeah, there's, um, there's, uh, there's a young, uh, 
couple of young, they were young when they started making them. <laughs> <laughs> filmmakers named Kent Bassett and Marianne Cunningham. Uh, and uh, they have had, well, Kent certainly had a history of some mind-body medicine issues of his own. And uh, he decided he wanted to make a full a feature length documentary. And somehow he ended up coming to me and somehow uh, patients that I was working with agreed to be filmed. And this was now, I think seven, almost eight years ago. Uh, and so it just, it just came out this year. It, it uh, premiered at, uh, in Austin, Texas at the Austin Film Festival in November. It was shown in Brooklyn, New York at a screen showing in February. And, and now it's available uh, online. Mm-hmm. And people, okay. they, they did a, like an Indiegogo campaign to help mm-hmm. fund it. They're in mm-hmm. debt. They, it's a labor of love to do this thing. And it follows a, a group of people going through a mind-body program for mm-hmm. chronic pain. One of the women was literally bedridden for eight years, mm-hmm. uh, ended up getting better. Uh, a young, there's a young teenager who had some ups and downs. And it's just a really... Uh, poignant story of, of people's lives going through this process. And as, as I try to guide them through it, it's called This Might Hurt. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's available for, a, I think the way, the way they have it set up, it's available for a tax deductible donation uh-huh. uh, to view <laughs> on their website, thismighthurtfilm.com. So. Okay, so people can go there and make a donation and download the movie and watch exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, once we get out of lockdown, we're committed to to doing a showing, either here in our office in Chicago or at one of the theaters in Chicago. You were going to be in town. We we're going to do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The yeah. Speaker. Oh well, um, <laughs> that didn't happen. So, all right. So, a little bit about mind body medicine in general. So, a couple of questions that I get asked regularly. Um, Any tips for people managing symptoms that they wouldn't necessarily hear of in other places? So out of the mainstream tips that you've picked up over time or ideas that people wouldn't necessarily know about, any that you frequently find yourself talking with people about? Well, You know, most of the most of the tips are in the main in my in our mainstream anyway, as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) You know, I keep keep revising my book every couple of years and adding more tips and more tips and more things. Um, But uh, one of the things that came up just this last week, uh, I'm working at. We'll I guess we'll talk about in a minute. I'm working with a a program in Las Vegas through United Health Group. Mm And uh, we had the, the fortune for hiring Christy Weepy. Mm-hmm. And Christy is a social worker, as you probably know, from, uh, well, she's originally from Connecticut, but she worked with Alan Gordon at the Pain Psychology Center in Los Angeles yeah. for many years. Yeah. And so we hired Christy, and Christy's in Las Vegas now, and she did a podcast on Curable mm-hmm. recently. And yeah. one of the things she said, she said, she said several amazing things. She's just so young, but so wise. And uh, she said, you know, you won't know when you get out of pain, you won't even know it. You won't even recognize it. And it's like, that's so counterintuitive Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because, you know, you'd think I'm living with pain every day. I would know if I'm out of pain. Mm -hmm. And her point, I think, was that the way out, the way of getting at one of the major ways of getting out of pain is to pay less attention to it, is Mm -hmm. to be less focused on it, less worried about it, less constantly obsessing about it. And if you do that, it'll kind of slip away. And you may not even notice when it slips away. I had some pretty significant upper back and neck kind of pain about four or five years ago. Uh, The fact that it happened when my mom was getting sick and dying was probably coincidental, don't you you think? Uh, Yeah, no, I I think I told you that at the time. Yeah, probably. But anyway, <laughs> it was it was at the same time. But in any case, it wouldn't go away. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just, my method of treating it was to basically wait it out. Mm-hmm. That's all I did. I didn't do anything mm-hmm. other than just, you know, just remind myself I'd be okay. Mm-hmm. And I just waited and waited. And then all of a sudden, it just slipped away. Yeah. It was an interesting, uh, interest. it took four, three or four months. Or so. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing is just one more thing I just mentioned is that, uh, 
sometimes people just try too hard. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen that a lot. Yep. Yep. And sometimes just stopping trying, stopping trying to fix it mm -hmm. uh, can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. And it's a form of, in a, in a sense, surrendering. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a form of complete acceptance. Mm -hmm. It's not acceptance that it'll be there forever, but it's acceptance that you're okay mm -hmm. with it or without it, that right. you're okay. Yeah. And surrendering to that can be a pretty powerful thing if you can get to that point i you know i talk with people a lot and i was had a class last night we were talking about this like so many people get here because their strategy of getting through life that's worked really well has been do more of it do it faster do it harder do it better work harder be better than the next person and that strategy just doesn't always work great when you're talking about health and pain in particular. And so it is one of the things that I talk with people about too, like trying softer mm -hmm. instead of trying harder or we're talking last night in class about the idea that sometimes you just have to not just do something, but sit there. Yeah. And that can be really hard for people who are used to just being able to make it work by, uh, by working harder and, and working better. Yeah. Because it's, it's a question of how much pressure you put on yourself. Mm -hmm. And people who learn that maybe at some point in their life, maybe they weren't good enough in some way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. or they had, or they were tried to, or needed, had trouble finding praise, mm -hmm. finding acceptance, uh, mm -hmm. worked harder, yeah, worked harder and harder and harder to prove that they were good enough, and that works. It's a very functional way of getting ahead in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it can be counterproductive in this sense when what we're talking about is more of a letting go mm -hmm. than a grabbing on. Yeah. Yeah. And to echo some of the things you said just a second ago, um, you know, interesting that you're talking about when your mother passed away, because I see that in almost everybody who has a relative die, there's some sort of physical aspect to the mourning of it. And so I, I rarely see people who get through that without their body responding. Right. one way or another, as if like there just is a physical aspect to mourning. That's part of yeah. the yeah. process. Well, all emotion, emotion is a physical event, really, yeah. by definition. Yeah. Uh, and pain is actually an emotion uh, when you think about it, uh, because it's, uh, it's something that's generated by the brain mm -hmm. in response to some stimulus. Mm -hmm. And it has a particular valency to it, a particular, mm -hmm. uh, you know, physicalness to it, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what an emotion is. Yeah. Uh, most people don't really realize that all pain is generated by the brain. Mm -hmm. It can be generated by the brain in the presence of physical injury or the absence of physical injury. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's something we learned a lot you know we never learned in medical school they're still not teaching it in medical school no definitely and, not uh, we it's really hard to break into a medical school even though i'm associated with two of them <laughs> uh to teach this stuff but eventually we will <laughs> I was giving, I don't, since I left working at the hospital, I don't work with the medical students at the moment, but I used to give a talk in this once, it was once a quarter actually. And so the, like a third of the class would rotate through each quarter. And, you know, I, I find medical students to be a really hard group to talk to. And so like 20, 25% of them are on their laptops at any given time. So like, I mean, 75 to 80% are not. So I feel like that's a victory. <laughs> But I was given the talk one year and I finished and asked if there were questions. And there's a guy in the back row who had been on his laptop the entire time. And he like, he closed the laptop and he raised his hand. And so I called on him and he said, so I have a friend who every time she gets a migraine, she'll envision it like a tiger and she'll go into her brain and she'll invite the tiger to tea and the two of them will sit down and then I'll hash it out. He's like, is that what you mean? I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually. That works. <laughs> That's what I mean. That's good. Yeah, um, so, so many ways of uh, conceptualizing this and there's no end to the creativity that, that people have. Um, There's an article in the paper just last month about, mm -hmm. about anxiety and how, 
one of the things this woman did was basically that with her her anxiety, which she had a name for, and uh, they would have conversations. And because we're we're talking to ourselves all the time, mm-hmm. people who think they don't talk to themselves mm-hmm. are crazy ones because we're always yeah, sending yeah. messages to ourselves about ourselves. And recognizing that and using that in, in, in healthy and helpful ways is, is a good thing. Yeah. Any other tips that you give people who say they've been working on this and working on this and working on this and working on this and not getting anywhere? So I get that question frequently, especially when we're talking to big groups. We know that there are people out who are out there who have been working on this for years, oftentimes, and, and not yeah. making progress. Anything that you routinely find is helpful in that situation? Well, one of the things that happens is people tend to get inwardly focused, mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. And so they're focused on their body, their symptoms, what's going on, analyzing it, overanalyzing it, microanalyzing it, trying to figure it out and sort it out. And so, and they do a lot of work, uh, journaling work, emotional processing work, et cetera. That's all part of that inward journey. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think you just need to stop that Mm -hmm. and start on the outward journey. And so the outward journey is just turning toward, toward life turning toward Mm -hmm. what's important in your life, turning toward what's meaningful, what's purposeful, Mm -hmm. turning toward helping others rather than worrying about yourself Mm -hmm. as much. And that I think can be really uh, beneficial in that that circumstance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also find too that, like when people ask me that question, like the inward focus, right? We can work on this and work on this, work on this. And sometimes we just can't get totally out of it by ourselves. And so, you know, so many different options for connection around this topic, starting with curable, um, the curable groups, the curable modules, my practice, your practice, all those psychotherapists out there who are now able to provide some, uh, some expertise remotely, at least during this time. And so sometimes we, we just can't quite do it on our own. And I think sometimes when people really get focused on, um, on working on it, doing the journal writing and the meditating, sometimes they have to bring other people into the picture with them in order to sort through like what are the right next steps. Yeah, you know, I, I saw, I got an email from a woman from Northern Michigan this week. Mm-hmm. I hadn't heard from her in a while. And she said, you know, I just felt so much shame that I hadn't been able to, to, to make mm-hmm. myself better. Like, mm-hmm. this yeah. is not your fault. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know, you're not alone. This no. is hard work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and blaming yourself may be a lifelong pattern, but uh, it's just not going to really be that helpful right now. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I've done a couple of podcasts with Curable, and I know as you have as well. One of them was about when I left Northwestern and set up my own practice and how stressful that was. And I've known about my body medicine for over two decades. And I, for that time, I just I couldn't get out of it on my own. And so reached out to some trusted colleagues and worked with them and, um, and sort of gradually found my way back to to feeling well, but it definitely uh, just needed, needed some help and needed to yeah. ask for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about some updates with mind body medicine. And so you mentioned Las Vegas a few minutes ago. Tell us a little bit more about what's going on there. Well, you know, um, there was an old song, taking it to the streets. Yeah. Do you know that? <laughs> by the <laughs> Doobie Brothers? Was that? Or? Was it by the Doobie Brothers? Was... I don't know. We have to look it up. I'll look it up. Someone chime in. That's <laughs> <laughs> a great song. <laughs> and that's what we're doing here. We're, our, you know, we've been working on our own in little, little isolated, uh, you know, practices all over the country, you know, these last 20 years, basically. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Sarno was working in an isolated practice in New York City for yeah. 40 years or whatever. Uh, and then we started doing research. So, you know, over the past decade or so, we've done some, I think, really helpful studies. And so now we can say not only do we have clinical evidence to show that 
uh, TSW, this stuff works, or other <laughs> language that you could use. Uh, and we have research data to show that this stuff works. And so the, uh, the insurance company, United Health Group, also has medical practices. They employ like 40,000 physicians, it turns out. And uh, they, they have a research and development arm that got interested in, in the brain, in neuroscience. And they've got some cognitive neuroscientists there. One of whom did a curable podcast the other day, Bethany Rains. Mm -hmm. And Bethany invited me to give a talk at a forum they had on pain about a year ago. And uh, they decided to take one of their clinics in Las Vegas, turn it into a model pain clinic where we're going to use, this is going to be mind-body medicine, our version of mind-body medicine mm -hmm. in, the, in the life, in the, on the streets, in the clinic. Mm -hmm and to analyze it and see how it works and to see if we can do something that we've all heard about, which is bend the curve, bend the curve of cost, bend the curve of back surgeries, bend the curve mm -hmm. of injections, bend the curve of opiate use in this yeah. population in, in Las Vegas as uh, in, in a pain. So we are training, Christy's there, as I said, I'm consulting, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we're training the doctors, the PAs, the medical staff, the social mm -hmm. workers, the physical therapists to all be in alignment. And they've got a lot of resources to bear on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's super exciting to have really this exciting. opportunity yeah. to, you know, to, to get to, to put it in, in real practice, real life situations, not people who are, you know, showing up, oh, I read about Dr. Sarno and I want to see you. It's not that. It's like, I got back pain. What are you going to do for me, buddy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where's my Vicodin? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, got something you know, better than that's Vicodin the plan. For you. What? I got something better than Vicodin for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it was the Doobie Brothers, by the way. It was. Wow, awesome. No, that's super exciting. Have, do you go out? Well, you're not going out to Las Vegas at the moment, so much. But, but yeah, a lot of conference calling. Yeah, uh, a lot of work together. A lot of training. Uh, we're doing a, we have a uh, training for physical therapists coming up in May. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, so it, it's, it's super exciting. And Christy is an amazing resource. She's an amazing person. She's really the, key, the key on the behavioral health side. And there's a, a physician assistant there who sees a ton of patients and mm -hmm. he's really open to this and really interested. And we've got a great physical therapist person. So we're just trying to build a team that can, yeah. That can help people. We'll see how it goes. That's great. That's great. That's fantastic. Um, we're going to move on to meditation in just a sec. Before we do, one of my patients yesterday asked me about psychedelics, which I know that is an interest of yours and sort of an interest of mine. Can we just talk for a minute or two about the potential future role of psychedelic medication uh, in the treatment of chronic pain? We cannot talk about it legally. All right. All right. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> okay. I, I have but, not, um, I there's not research. Describe any of that medication. There is research. There's research. There is research. I know some patients who managed to get involved in some trials. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, the, apparently the, some of the research trials have like thousands of people on their waiting list. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, yeah it's insane how how, uh, you know, this has changed in the last decade. And it was so dormant for so long. It was mm -hmm. banned, mm -hmm. still banned. But uh, most people think that the data is supporting uh, legalization mm -hmm. within certain clinical settings for <laughs> uh, medications like MDMA, uh, uh, also known as ecstasy, LSD, mm -hmm. psilocybin, mm -hmm. um, the MDMA is particularly interesting because it has a lot of um, activity in uh, helping people feel um, calm and loved, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak, yeah. and blissful even, yeah. uh, which is an amazing thing for people who haven't been able to, you know, have that kind of experience. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, you've, yeah, I mean, we've, we were just talking the other day with uh, a mutual friend who yeah. had an amazing, amazing experience. So yeah, the, the data is really amazingly positive, uh, especially when you compare it to, uh, you know, psych the kind of typical psychiatric medication, which sure. 
can have you know side effects. You know, oftentimes, it's not better than placebo. It's just it's not a great great track record. Yeah, uh, with psychiatric medications, but you know, so far, you know, this is pretty darn promising, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when it'll be more uh, more available. The some of the reading that I've done on it says that it can, in some sense, be a shortcut to a spiritual experience for people, or that's what people report in certain situations when they're doing it therapeutically. And mm -hmm. I know that for a number of my patients who've gotten better with mind body medicine, like there is a spiritual component to it. It's they say in the aftermath that the pain has driven them places where they needed to go that they wouldn't be able to get to otherwise, or the pain give them insight into what to do next in ways that, um, that they couldn't, their brain wouldn't let them get to. And so it really feels to me like if we could use some of these substances to help people provide or help provide for people that type of insight in a controlled and quick way, that we could potentially push people forward in their understanding of the pain, their own pain, um, yeah. much more quickly than we sometimes do now. It can also help people face fears. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. there's a component of these experiences that are very fearful. Yeah. Very fearful. Yeah. And if people are ready for that or able to lean into that and go into that in a way that allows them to be in that state, without uh, decompensating, which is usually what happens, then yeah. it's a, uh, that can be a breakthrough uh, kind of experience, kind of experience as well. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's exciting to think about and be interesting to see what happens over the next few years as people get more comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about meditation a little bit. And so you were a mindfulness meditation instructor before you opened your mind body medicine Correct. practice. And can you talk a little bit about sort of how you made that transition and what made you want to make that transition back then? This was uh, 15, 20 years ago, probably. Yeah. 20 years ago. Well, 20 years ago, 21 years ago now, I guess, is when I started uh, mindfulness meditation work and, practice and, and teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when you look back at things, when you look retrospectively, you can see how one thing led to the other, how everything was just a perfect meld, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from one thing to the other and led you to where you are now. I don't know that that really is true. It's easy <laughs> to see it that way in retrospect. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Uh, I had a patient the other day. This, this patient is an angel. Uh -huh. She's just an angel. And she, she's a, a blue collar working class woman, tough and strong and smart and wise. And she looked at me and she said, Dr. Schubiner, you were made to do this work. And I go, yeah, yeah. She goes, no, 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 you're not listening. To me. <laughs> Dr. Schubiner, look me in the eye. I mean, she's an angel. And so, and I just kind of had to agree with her, you know, but how did that come about? You know, what was that arc? What was that path? You know, when you talk to young people and look at their paths of life, they don't know where they're going. And the best advice I think you can give young people is don't worry about your path. Just do something. You know, just act. Just, mm -hmm. just go with whatever seems reasonable at the moment. It'll all work out. It, the, your path will evolve. It'll, it'll occur. And that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And so mindfulness opened up a lot of gates toward toward uh, looking at the mind and being involved in it. But frankly, I was really interested in that when I was in college back mm -hmm. in the 70s. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but the, the, the most direct link was interesting. It was because a friend of mine who knew I was interested in, in meditation uh, was the one who said, uh, Howard, you should look at this book by Dr. Sarman back in 2001 or two. Mm -hmm. And I read the book and that, I just got intrigued. You yeah. know, I just said, well, this is, it was the right time and the right place for me. And, um, mm -hmm. and I was fortunate enough to have the background in, in mindfulness to kind of propel me or use a bit. I was doing mindfulness groups. And so I started doing mind body groups. And mm -hmm. It just seemed like uh, a natural progression. So. Yeah. And one of the things I feel like I've heard you say, and I may have this wrong, is that the mindfulness meditation, when you were teaching that, like people's pain didn't go away, right? Well, when they teach it in, 
in Massachusetts, John Kabat-Zinn and his colleagues, like part of what they're doing is trying to get people's pain better managed or, or get people's right. pain less, especially in the, in the cancer clinics. And I don't know that that was your experience as much. And I say that to people too, sometimes that like we can be, we can become great meditators, but there's oftentimes something else that needs to be involved in order to use that skill to help with the pain. Um, and yeah. so when you think about that, where do you see the link? I think I say meditation is necessary, but not sufficient to help people with pain. But how do you see it? What's the role of the meditation portion when people are trying to understand how to use mind-body medicine? To right. Yeah, it's a great question. I've thought about that a lot because, um, you know, when I started teaching mindfulness, uh, people had great results. People had amazing results. People ben seemed to benefit greatly from it. But in terms of getting people out of pain, not so much. Mm -hmm. And I, I mainly attributed that to me not being a good enough teacher, which certainly could be the case. And in fact, I remember reading, um, uh, one of my teachers were John Kabat-Zinn and Saki Santorelli mm -hmm. from UMass mm -hmm. uh, in Amherst. And, um, and uh, Saki wrote a book many years ago. And in his book, there was a description of a patient who had pain who was doing mindfulness, who didn't get better. And I was like, thank God it's not. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. I really, I, I just really thought it was my fault. <clears throat> and what I've, and then, so what's happened over the years? Well, research has come out. Mm -hmm. And research shows that mindfulness meditation per se, just mindfulness for chronic pain, back pain or fibromyalgia pain or whatever, is no better than standard cognitive behavioral therapy. That's what the data shows yeah. in random, large randomized controlled studies. So mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say that mindfulness isn't beneficial. I think everyone in the whole country, in the world, should learn mindfulness. Children, everyone, no mm -hmm. question about it. Yeah. But what's, what, so wh why, does it, why does that happen? And my view is that what we're doing in mind-body medicine is we're helping people understand the role of the mind. We're helping people understand why they have pain. We're actually making an accurate diagnosis of the cause of the pain, which when it is mind-body pain or neural circuit pain, then that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is that, and I say this, this may be a shocking statement to some people, but if you look at the whole, ho the whole range of chronic pain in this country, 80 to 90% of it is due to mind-body issues or neural circuitry issues or just brain induced pain mm -hmm. rather than structure induced pain. And I can, we can talk a lot about why I would say that, but I, there's data to support, you know, why I'm saying that, of course, mm -hmm. and you know that. But the point is, is that most people don't have that view. So when you have pain, your view of the pain is there's something wrong in my body. Who wouldn't think that? Right. So when you do mindfulness meditation and you're viewing the pain as being something wrong in your body, you can notice it and you can de-identify with it, but you're not really going to de-identify with it to that degree yeah. that you're going to, you know, you're actually going to overcome it. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing in mind body medicine, we're taking, you know, we're talking to people and we're examining them and we're looking at their lab and the x-rays and everything and we're making a diagnosis. Oh, you've got a mind, your pain is due to your brain. There's nothing wrong in your body. Mm -hmm. Now, we've just taken that pain and we've turned it into basically a thought. Mm -hmm. We've taken that pain and we've turned it into basically a construct of the mind or a thought. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you do mindfulness meditation and you notice your thoughts, guess what? You can de-identify with them because mm -hmm. they're just thoughts. Yeah. They're, they're just parts of your, they're just something your brain has, has generated and it's maybe not that important. And if you put pain in that category, now all of a sudden mindfulness meditation can be extraordinarily helpful mm -hmm. for, uh, for reducing or eliminating mind-body pain. Yeah. Uh, especially when mindfulness meditation is... Um, connected to or associated with emotional processing. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes mind, so that's the two things that mindfulness meditation by itself per se, without 
the context of a diagnosis and knowing it's a mind-body problem mm -hmm. and without the connection to emotional processing. Because a lot of times mindfulness meditation is thought or is experienced more as a cerebral uh, type of practice, right. cognitive type of practice, yeah. and not maybe not so much touching to emotions. And that, that may depend on the person as well. Yeah. And so, uh, so mindfulness can be extraordinarily helpful, especially when we're adding the diagnosis, we're helping people understand what's wrong with them. Because when you're sitting in mindfulness and you get an itch, you know, you know it's just an itch. And you yeah. just sit and then it goes away. Yeah. And so same thing. Uh, one of my patients has been doing really well for years now. She started in 2013, I think it was, said like she had migraines for 40 years and she was going to get rid of them. So she took a, a mindfulness-based stress reduction class, one of John Kabat-Zinn's classes, and she loved it fantastic but that didn't touch the migraines but then somebody introduced her to me and we talked about it and once she had is exactly what you said once she had that framework yeah. like she was better really quickly and so i find that people who have those mindfulness skills and have those meditation skills when they add this in can make a ton of progress really quickly yeah, yeah exactly because they're great skills and the skills are amazing yeah uh because you're you're practicing noticing with less reactivity. It's yeah. a powerful, powerful skill. Yeah. So would you be willing to lead us through a meditation? I will. Great. <laughs> was this planned? This was planned. Okay. <laughs> and nobody is out there at the moment. We're posting this as soon as we're done. And so you're going to lead me. I'll lead you, John. Okay, meditation. We've never done this before. <laughs> no. If I fall asleep, just, um, just yeah, poke, me, you. poke me through the screen. <laughs> That's good. All right. Yeah. So let's, um, let's just see if we can go to a place of uh, quiet for a moment. Uh, just take a few deep breaths. If you feel comfortable closing your eyes, you can do that. Or you can just look down into your lap. Hopefully you can be in a somewhat comfortable position, but it doesn't really matter if you're sitting or lying or standing or walking or whatever. I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty loose with <laughs> with meditation positions, just my view. And if we just focus on the breath for a moment, just noticing breathing, breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. Knowing that the breath is fine. You don't have to change it or alter it. You can just watch it. And you can just engage with it. You can be with the breath and notice the breath and feel it. Noticing the air as it rushes in through your nose her mouth, and noticing the air as it rushes out. Noticing the chest expand, and then fall back, chest breathing. Noticing, accepting, and letting go, turning to the next breath. One breath at a time. And I'm just going to lead all of you through four steps as part of this little exercise. And the first one is to just 
turn your attention to any thoughts or feelings that arise in your mind right now. Just opening up your mind to whatever thoughts and feelings arise. Not trying to generate thoughts or feelings, not trying to suppress them, but just noticing what arises moment by moment. Each thought is just a thought. You can notice it. Knowing that you probably don't have to do anything about that thought right now. You can just watch it. If it's important, you can take care of it later. But just allowing yourself to notice thoughts. Accept them as just thoughts. And just gently say to your brain, next. What's next? What's here? And of course, sometimes feelings will arise, as we talked about earlier. Sometimes it's necessary to be sad or to grieve. That's necessary, that's important, it's part of who we are, it's part of what we do as human beings. And to allow that, knowing that it's okay, emotions won't hurt us or harm us. And it's necessary sometimes to worry it's normal to be afraid at times, at times like this. And that's okay too. It's okay to feel the feelings of fear when they arise. Knowing once again, it won't harm us. Feelings come and if we don't block them or suppress them, they will come, they will settle, and they will release as we breathe. And sometimes it's necessary to be frustrated or even angry. Again, it's necessary. It's part of what we are, what we do, who we are part of the range of human emotions that we can engage with and be with and accept and feel. And we can breathe with and we can release knowing that emotions will come, they will go they will rise and they will fall. And now turning your attention back to the breathing, taking a couple deep breaths, focusing on the breath, And I'm going to ask all of you now to notice times in the past when you faced challenges, when things were difficult in your life, that you had to rise to that challenge, whatever those times may have been. And see if you can think about what skills you use to meet those challenges. What abilities you use then? Was it thinking through problems? 
Was it persistence and hard work? Was it reaching out for help from others? Was it confidence knowing that you could handle it? Knowing that you would be okay? Realize that you have these skills now, just as you had them. And the challenges that face us now require those skills that you have and that you can bring to bear now. Connecting to confidence and ability to work and persist and to think and to solve problems and to get through. And know that you will get through this as we will get through this together. And now think for a moment of people that you care for. Picture in your mind's eye someone or a few people or a group of people that you care for. Allow the feelings of caring and connection to grow between you and them. And each time you do this exercise, you can choose different folks, maybe some that are the closest to you, or maybe even some that you might have lost contact with or haven't seen in a while. Or people that you just, just want to wish well to, who may, you may not even know all that well. People who are doing good work these days. People who are caring for the sick. People who are getting food to all of us. And see if you can feel the feelings of caring that you have toward them and that they have toward you. You are not alone. And even though we may not be able to see in person and touch and hug some of the people we love and care for, we can connect to them in a whole variety of ways. And one way is this way. And just breathe in those feelings of caring and con connection. And as we begin to head into the last part of this exercise, this meditation, I'm asking you to see what you can be grateful for right now, to move your attention to gratitude for whatever pops into your mind right now. There's so many things to be grateful for. And just allow your mind to create a little bit of an inventory of the little things and the big things 
the important things and the seemingly little or inane or silly things that we're all grateful for. In our part of the country, this is springtime and blossoms are occurring and the weather is warming. And in many places, the curve of the coronavirus illness is beginning to flatten and we're beginning to see some hope. And as I said earlier, goodness always comes out of adversity. There's always some goodness that comes in times that are difficult. And that's happening now. To be thankful for the people who are helping each other, who are looking out for each other, who are connecting to each other. And maybe there's a certain level of spirituality or faith that you connect to that's important to you, that you might want to access now or tap into. There are some things that are just bigger than us. And sometimes that's an important part of how we deal with times that are challenging and that are difficult. And as you focus back on the breathing, as you turn your attention back to the breath, breathing in and breathing out, knowing that you have the ability to be with, pay attention to and engage in whatever thoughts arise in your mind, be with and engage with whatever feelings arise in your mind and your body, and that's okay. Knowing that you can connect to skills and abilities that you have, that you've used in your life, and that you can use now, that you need now, in order to face what's going on in this time, in these difficult times. And knowing that you can connect to others in caring and compassion. And that others can connect to you in so many different ways. Knowing that you're not alone. And we're all going through this together. And finally, knowing that you can connect to gratitude. And to faith and to goodness. And just breathing with that. And whenever you're ready, allowing yourself to take a couple deep breaths, and whenever you're ready, allowing your eyes to open, to rejoin whoever you're with, wherever you are, to rejoin us. And just thanking, thanking you for 
being here doing this together with John and I and uh, being part of this community. Thank you. It's, um, I'm not that much of a meditator and I find myself when I do it, it's oftentimes very short, three minutes, five minutes, if that. And so it was really nice to have you lead me through that. And it makes the longer, it makes it so easy. Yeah, I've been working on my med meditation voice. I like your meditation. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh it's it's nice to be led sometimes, you know, to kind of give give up control and uh yeah. just allow yourself to just go with whatever. And you know, it's hard to lead a meditation. You don't know who's at who's who's at where they're at or whatever, but you yeah. know, these are just kind of general general principles that might be useful. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice too. Like it just there's so much focus on the virus and everything that goes with it and so to have that opportunity to step away from that to think about what i'm grateful for kind of what's good i appreciate that thank you yeah 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 i know like we have our our virtual uh you know dinner dates and then you know let's see what should we talk about well <laughs> <laughs> i know let's talk about the virus so that's a good one <laughs> We talk about that for 15 or 20 minutes and then uh -huh. we say, oh, now what we should talk about. Let's talk about how are you getting your food? You know, I mean, it's yeah. really kind of basic stuff. Yeah. Um, do you have time to answer a few questions? Sure. People had sent these in on the page. Um, oh, let's just, we'll start at the top and we'll see where we get to. Um, autoimmune and mind body. Any thoughts about autoimmunity? Yeah. Well, um, there's no doubt. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of literature now that shows that uh, people who have uh, had difficult childhoods, people with mm -hmm. high adverse childhood event scores have higher mm -hmm. levels of autoimmune disorder, mm -hmm. not to mention a whole host of other mm -hmm. disorders as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that connection is well-founded in science. Um, uh, and so the fact that there can be an emotional component to the development of an autoimmune disorder is, is, is real. It's, it's there. Absolutely. Um, and autoimmune disorders are also structural disorders. They have pathology in the body. You know, there can be damage to joints or mm -hmm. skin or a whole variety of uh, tissues, kidneys, whatever. Um, uh, so, uh, oftentimes autoimmune disorders are treated by medicines and we have a number of good medicines that can help people with autoimmune disorders, mm -hmm. but the brain and the immune system interact, guess what? And so, uh, it's, it's not uncommon. It's, it's well known that, uh, what we think and what we feel and emotional issues in our lives can affect our immune system. So using a mind-body approach in conjunction with the medical approach to me makes perfect sense for mm -hmm. for people with autoimmune disorders yeah um, it i oftentimes will refer people to donna jackson nakazawa who i think you you know i believe yeah. in her great book the last best cure she talks about the state of what we know about the connection between traumatic experiences and autoimmunity and also a description of her year treating her own autoimmune disease. I think it's more, more yoga, more meditation, more acupuncture and more psychotherapy and just how much better her autoimmune disease got using those yeah. types of modalities for a whole year. And then Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score is a great source of information about right. autoimmune disease and what we know about how our experiences make their way into our bodies and into our immune systems. Yeah, it just so happens I was talking with Donna this week mm -hmm. and um, she was telling me about um, some back pain that she had yeah. that was not an autoimmune disorder, but was purely a mind-body disorder. So, you know, you can have both, but yeah. she's much better, which and on good. both counts. So, good. Yeah. Um, I think she's got a new book out. I think I heard. I, she I don't has know. a new book called The Angel and the Assassin. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have not read it, but. Um, yeah. About microglia. 
Um, let's see, next question. Reading Back in Control by our colleague, David Hanscom. And I want to get in the habit of daily expressive writing. Any tips? I don't really like it. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I mean, to me, for some people, it can be like miraculous. It's just the greatest thing ever, mm -hmm. but not for everybody. Yeah. I and mean, some people don't really like it. And for some people, you know, may not be quite, you know, everything that what it is for other people. And you know, I, I'm fine with it. I don't, to me, there's just so many ways of, of, mm -hmm. of working with, uh, with our minds and bodies that I don't feel locked in to, to say you have to do X, Y, or Z. And if you mm -hmm. don't, and so if you're a, to me, I don't, I always tell people, you know, I have a book on this and there's a lot of writing in it. And I, I what I tell you, don't be a slave to the book, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, do what makes sense, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try it or, or mm -hmm. see how it might be useful. And I mean, obviously, sometimes if there's tremendous resistance to something, it might mean that there's something important there. So, sure. You know, you can it, yeah, and there's so many different types of writing exercises. The research is about you know, 20 minutes of writing about thoughts and feelings in terms of stressful yeah. events that are going on or have happened in the past. And so um, lots of ways, including uh, through our practice to, to get access to exercises like that and Howard's book. Um, Dr. Hanscom frequently talks about the negative writing. And so taking your thoughts, your negative thoughts each day, getting them out onto the computer screen or onto a piece of paper and then just throwing them yeah. away. And so like other habits, I think, you know, getting started is the key and don't not pushing yourself if you can do it for five minutes you do it for five minutes you do it for two minutes you do it for two minutes um our 12 year old a couple weeks ago had a migraine and migraine rule in our family is you have to write down everything you're stressed about and everything you're <laughs> mad at and he's like i'm not stressed um, <laughs> he wrote down like four things he was mad at including coronavirus that was number one um and i didn't hear anything about the migraine after that. And so four, four sentences yeah. um, was really helpful. Now he's 12 and 12 year old brains are really pliable, but, um, but starting yeah, I, small and, and keeping the pressure off to, to do it the, the right way. There's no right. Yeah. Way. Yeah. And there's so many different uh, types of exercise. So probably someone will find something that will be useful. Sometimes I see people say I'm writing, I write, I'm writing the same thing every day. Well, mm -hmm. I always say stop writing. Yeah. If you're writing yeah. the same thing every day, yeah. uh, you know, it's not the, that useful. The other one that I tell people, and I um, was talking with somebody about this the other day, is that some people, like the writing won't be helpful, and I'll ask them, what are you writing about? And they're like, oh, I'm writing about what a terrible person I am. Um, exactly. And so when we start to attack ourselves in the writing, it's never helpful, yeah. ever. Yeah. And so yes. if you yeah. find yourself there, I say either – get that under control or just stop. But when we start to attack ourselves through the writing, yeah. it, it doesn't yeah. go well. Yeah, uh, I think I have this thing. I, I, I think that children should have a whiteboard in their bedroom that says things that make me sad, things that make me mad, things that make me glad. Mm -hmm. And they should be able to just write whatever, the, just write down things that make you sad, mad, or glad. I think that would yeah. be good. <laughs> yeah, you said for adults, right? No, no, for kids. Yeah, and adults. <laughs> Uh, next question is about eczema um, and condition response. Yeah. So eczema flares up from taking too many hot baths. Um, this was a common trigger, uh, but I had a bad cold and was taking several hot baths a day. I had no flare ups. So it's not just a result of soaking in hot water. How do I break the condition response of a bath causing the eczema? And so I think that's similar to what we were talking about earlier with condition yeah. responses. Yeah. Yeah. Like the shower. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, you can use imagination to and graded exposure to, uh, to, to, you know, uh, uh, re rewire the condition responses in the brain. And, um, but you know, I think it's important to know that you can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of times we've, you know, we've seen a lot of eczema and we've seen a lot of mind body eczema. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, when you're seeing it as a condition response that way, I think it's really important to, to be confident, to know that you can do this, yeah. that you will be okay. And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, again, through imagination and then great exposure to become closer and closer to doing that with this calm and, 
observing and amusing mind to just watch what happens and see what your brain does. So. Yeah. This next question is a good one. How normal is it to have a resurgence of symptoms, maybe even worse than before, uh, for someone in this time who's not hit terribly hard by the pandemic? Well, um, you know, if you're not hit particularly hard by it yourself, I mean, I'm not hit particularly hard by it at all. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I'm feeling very guilty that I'm not in the hospital taking care of coronavirus patients because I'm a doctor. And that weighs on my mind. And so, you know, there's no, there's no, just because, you know, no one in your family is directly affected uh, doesn't mean that you're not affected by this. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, I mean, you know this, you know, um, the vast majority of thoughts that people have are actually subconscious. Mm -hmm. So, we're just, you know, this, this person may be saying, yeah, I'm not affected by it, but why are my symptoms coming up so much? Well, obviously, there's a reason. Yeah. And, uh, you know, your brain is reacting to something, and there's a lot of stuff. If you watch the news, my wife had to stop watching the news. It was just too, too, yeah. too hard. Yeah. It, and I've been saying to people a lot that, you know, the, just the combined level of stress, the societal level of stress is higher than I've ever seen it. At the beginning, I was comparing it to 9-11, but this is way worse than yeah. that. It's sort of this ongoing, uncertain time. The political climate's not helping no matter which side of the aisle people are on. And, and my patients who are sensitive, which is most of them, and probably a lot of people who are, who are watching, um, we take that on, whether we want to or not. And so I think- Yeah, it's... totally. My, my daughter, she, you know, she calls me every day. Are you okay, dad? Yeah. You're still alive? You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're old, dad. You're at high risk. You know, thanks. Uh, you know, are you going outside? No, don't go outside, dad. Are you wearing a mask? Always wear a mask. You know, the other day I, I went out to take our garbage out and, uh, there, and I kind of almost bumped into somebody Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't actually bump into them, but it yeah. just freaked me out. Like we're afraid of other people. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, it, you know, and it's that's... like nine 11, you know, you're afraid of getting on a plane or something, yeah. but this is afraid of other people. I know. I mean, you know. that was, you know, I, I got sick after that, you know, my stomach was bothering me and mm -hmm. I felt like I had a fever. And then my wife said, I'm going to quarantine you. And then I yeah. was taking my temperature every half hour. And, I know. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, and then what we were talking about earlier too, like, I mean, the stress is so high and everybody feels it. And, and people who are here, like, I feel like this group does way better in managing it than, than most do. And so knowing about how stress gets into our bodies and knowing that that's what's going on, it gives people a huge advantage over people who are locked in a medical model and are wondering why they're, yeah. stomachs are upset or their back is out or their eczema is flared or whatever else. Right. And they have to come up with explanations that are far-fetched. Yeah. I must have slept wrong. I must have, uh, it must be the barometric pressure, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it must be my allergies or, you know, all sorts of things that, you know, may make sense, but it really doesn't get at the issue of the mind body connection. Yeah. Next question is about sleep and overnight symptoms. And so I'm going to combine two questions here. So this one says they do fine during the day. Um, they have some neuropathy and erythromyalgia, so burning feet. And they're fine during the day, but as soon as they get into bed, um, it gets worse. She knows it's TMS, but, but doesn't know why. And then the flip side of that is patients who say they do fine most of the time, um, but they wake up with symptoms, headache or yeah. plantar fasciitis or whatever else. And so any thoughts about symptoms that happen in the overnight period, either in the time leading into falling asleep or the time leading into waking up? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was talking to a woman about that very thing today. Mm -hmm. On one hand, it's, it's a condition response. You know, on one hand, your, your brain is using that time of day, either the time in the evening or the morning time, waking up time as a condition response, like, okay, time for symptoms, time for pain, time for whatever. Um, 
But also, uh, in particular, this woman, you know, she was busy during the day and she's busy during the day and her mind's got stuff to do. Her mind's paying attention to stuff. And, and then night comes and it's time to relax. And mm-hmm. you, can, you know, you're supposed to be able to calm your brain and relax and go to sleep. And all of a sudden the brain is attacking, you know, attacking me. What, you know, what's going on here? It's just super common that the brain will do that to fill the void mm-hmm. and to, uh, and to, um, you know, it, it's just a good time to scare us. You know, in a sense, you know, the brain is an alarm mechanism. It's like a smoke alarm. It's a danger mechanism, and it's trying to scare us because a good alarm will scare you. A good smoke alarm will be loud, and it's being really loud in the, at night, you know, to really scare people and make them afraid that they won't sleep, which is really, can certainly yeah. be really scary. So it's it's doing its job in a sense. You know, it's just doing what it uh, it knows how to do and can do. And our job is to understand that it is afraid. Mm-hmm. Like if your kid is under the bed, afraid of a monster in the closet, you're not going to yell at him and scream at him and tell him he's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to be kind to him and be nice to him and say, gee, I understand. I know you're afraid, but it's going to be okay. And so treating ourselves with kindness, we kind of touched on that earlier, not beating ourselves up, treating our brain with kindness and not viewing the symptoms that we have as our enemy or is that our brain really betraying us, but actually trying to help us or trying to protect us uh, can really help and so that we can work with our brain in a more calm way, in a more constructive way. Yeah. And then thoughts about sort of the symptoms as people get out of sleep in the morning, people go to bed feeling okay, but wake up with whatever you've got going on. Yeah. Sometimes I've had people talk to themselves before they go to sleep to Mm -hmm. talk to their brain before they go to sleep, kind of remind their brain that, you know, it's okay. I didn't really hurt. I'm not going to hurt myself, Mm -hmm. you know, sleeping. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and it's a conditioned response. So the first thing when you wake up, if you don't have pain, the first thing when you first open your eyes, you might just take a moment to, to calm. You might just mm-hmm. take a moment to remind yourself that you're okay, that you're going to be okay, that you're going to work today or do whatever you're going to do today, you know, whether you have pain or not, mm-hmm. uh, to try to take the fear of it. Because if you're anticipating, oh, my God, this is going to be bad. Oh my God, am I going to have the pain or not? Uh, you don't want to go into the night worrying, worrying about the morning. Mm-hmm. You know, what you want to do is go into the night knowing that you'll be okay, whatever. You'll be okay either way, whether you have pain or not. Yeah. Uh, because if you, you know, you know, you go to bed and say, well, I pray I won't have it. And then you have it and then you're disappointed. That's just not a good, that's not a good recipe. Yeah. I had a conversation with somebody the other day who was asking that question, doing pretty well, but morning wakes up and the pain's bad and sort of asked her about it. And, you know, she'd wake up, pain kind of feel stiff or symptoms. And then she said, you know, within a few minutes, it was better. And when I talk with people about plantar fasciitis, that's a common symptom that people get in the morning, right? It's yeah. pain in the bottom of the feet and you wake up and you step out of bed and you step down and you're like, oh, oh. and then you kind of waddle into the shower and get yeah. ready and then it's gone. Um, but people can worry about plantar fasciitis and I've had patients who've had multiple surgeries and they like tear their, you know, they cut into the fascia and they try to loosen oh, it up. Yeah. And, um, and it just, it had the feeling of that to me and we talked through it and I think, you know, we're human. If we're lying in bed for eight hours or we stiffen up a little bit and sometimes it can take a little bit of time for us to loosen up and get lubricated and start our day. And I think, you know, maybe as we get a little bit older or the stress is a little bit higher, that can happen. And I think what she was doing was that like she was noticing this was a couple of minutes and she was just like so hard on herself that she had failed. Like she had failed. She was working on this and she got it, but she couldn't control it. You know, yeah. And so it became another opportunity for her to get mad at herself. And so we normalized that and talked about it. And I think it made sense. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're, if you catch your kid with their hand in the cookie jar, you can swat them and say, get out of here. You can say, I see you, but it's not going to work. Nice try. 
Yeah. And just in a kind and gentle way. I had that for a while where I would get out of bed and my feet would, bottom of my feet would hurt. And I would walk and it would hurt and then it would go away. And but that doesn't do it anymore. It yeah. wasn't age, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no. I'm older now than I was then. <laughs> it was just my brain. And why it did it, you know, I have no clue. But, you know, it, it just went away as I, you know, kind of didn't worry yeah. about it too much. Yeah. Um, exercise. And so somebody wrote in aches and pains. You start exercising more. They really like it. Um, but having some flare-ups, any thoughts about how to manage that? So is it, the thing that I always talk to people about is, are you having pain when you're exercising or after exercising? Mm -hmm. And frequently what happens is, is that people have the pain after the exercise, but not while they're exercising. Mm -hmm. Again, in part, because the brain is busy with, with the activity of exercising and it just allows you to exercise. Mm -hmm. But when you have pain, not with exercising, but after exercising, that's, that's a mind-body problem. That's a diagnostic test. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's been really useful to separate that out. And it's yeah. really kind of the brain is almost punishing you. Say, oh, you're actually, I'll let you exercise, but now, you know, now here's, yeah. here's, here you're going to pay for it. And so, yeah, um, so, yeah, so uh, I really want to help people understand that they're not damaged. You know, if, you're, if your arm is broken, it'll hurt when you move it, not when you stop. Yeah. And they're getting the opposite thing. So, yeah. so really knowing that and just, and just having them talk to themselves and tell themselves while they're exercising that they're okay. This won't bother me. Everything's fine. And when they're done saying, I'm okay. And if it hurts, it hurts. If it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt. But I don't care because I know I'm okay. Yeah. And gradually. And a lot of times you may have to cut back. Like I saw a guy today who was having, well, this wasn't pain after exercise. This was pain during exercise. But he would walk mile and a half and he'd be fine and then he'd walk a mile and a half back and it, it was like walking on glass like it was just like insanely painful yeah, yeah. um and so he can kind of gut that out and keep doing it and doing it and doing it but the pain was so intense i suggested that he cut back yeah and then he just yeah. start doing smaller distances yeah and gradually work up to why you know you can't you know when, when you're having you know that severe pain it's pretty hard to just kind of yeah. Observe it. <laughs> yeah. We, um, I was talking to somebody this morning and I do. It's getting dark in here. Yeah. I do <laughs> think that, uh, yeah, we've gone on so long that yeah. <laughs> I'm starting to set uh, in, the, in the East. Um, I was talking to somebody this morning and we're talking about like regulating the begin as you get back into exercise. And so, you know, Dr. Sarno, bless his heart, like, go, go go run. Um, yeah. And I find that a lot of people need to ease back into it. So somebody this morning was said, you know, she's a ex college athlete. And so it was, has high, um, high standards for her body. And so she's kind of getting back into it. She said, you know, the other day I went over and I went to my mom's house and, you know, we have this thing where we tread water for an hour. So we did. And I was super hour. sore afterwards. Yeah. I know that's what my <laughs> response. I was like, 10 minutes or five minutes. Um, and so we're just talking about like how we give ourselves the space to gradually start increasing what we can do. And it's super frustrating for people who've been athletes and yeah. have run marathons before and now feel like, ah, oh, I can't even walk a mile. But if we get mad at ourselves for not being, can only being able to walk a mile, then we can't, we can't walk a mile. And so, yeah. you know, the theme that we're talking about being kind to ourselves as we're, getting back into this. And then I've been fascinated actually with uh, the latest research on how important rest is in terms of exercise and training. And I, you know, I watch the, the NBA basketball players and they play way less than they did when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And that's the science of it that like, you know, it's like over 28 minutes per game in a NBA basketball game really ramps up the likelihood mm -hmm. that people will get injured. And so um, keeping in mind that sometimes when we push our bodies, our bodies say like, yeah, I'm fine to be pushed and I need some rest as part of the training. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to Charlie, uh, Charlie Merrill about that. Cause he works in mm -hmm. Boulder. And yeah. People out there are <laughs> yeah. insane ultra, ultra athletes and, uh, yeah. It's really interesting talking to him about them. Yeah. Um, 
A couple of questions about your book, sort of getting started with it and liking it, but not seeing progress and sort of how to combine what you write with um, some of the other resources like Curable. Yeah, I, I, I really don't think that people should think that one thing is always going to be the answer for them. And, uh, and so, you know, being a, even with my books, I suggest people be eclectic in terms of picking and choosing the things within it that they think will be useful, that they find mm -hmm. attractive. And yeah. so the same thing. And of course, as you pointed out earlier, uh, you know, if you're working alone, you know, you might need a community, mm -hmm. you know, you might want a community, you might want to. You know, and that's one of the things Curable's, Curable offers, obviously. Yeah. You might, you know, you might want a therapist. And most, most people can't really talk too much to their family or friends about this because their family yeah. or friends don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And their family and friends often really kind of undermine it by saying, well, you know, just go to the doctor. or You know, maybe you need some injections or, you know, maybe you need a new mattress, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard because it's often really lonely. You know, it's often lonely doing this work. So, so uh, you know, reaching out and, and looking for other resources, I think, is, a, you know, often a great idea. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I've seen people who are doing all the resources all the time. And I'm not sure that's always the best way to go. I've done, you know, I've read all of these books and all of these and all of these and all of these. And that gets back to the trying too hard, I think. So right. I think striking a balance makes sense. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, you know, I recommend your book to people all the time. And, um, and a lot of people will use that in combination with, um, you know, seeing you or seeing me or, as you said, just reaching out and mm -hmm. really combining all the great resources that are out there. I also just want to highlight what you said about how hard it is to talk to, to family members about it. I sort of figure that somewhere between one in 10 or one in a, somewhere between one in 10 and one in a hundred people is ready to, to hear about this, right? A lot of people you say like, Hey, you know, your back pain, there may be a psychological component to it. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> you smoking buddy. Um, and, and so in absolute numbers, that's a lot of people. I don't know what 1% of 300 billion or, you know, 5 billion is, but it's a lot of people who are ready to understand this. But when you think about your circle and especially your COVID circle, like there aren't a lot of people standing literally next to you who are going to understand. And so I think that's one of the reasons that the curable community um, sort of is able to bring the people from all over who get this and want to work on it. In this yeah. way. We're going to find out what percentage of people are going to be open to this in our, in our Las Vegas project. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are because, you know, people are coming for referrals for pain. They're not coming to a mind body. They're coming for pain. And, yeah. and we're going to see, you know, how much we're able with our best efforts to help people understand these concepts and we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, all right. Just a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, what if I don't have a mystery pain, but a diagnosed structural problems, for example, hip dysplasia, is it possible to override the structural issues? Um, we've had success with curable. Um, how do we interact with other clinicians who don't necessarily take this into account? And so right. is there anything that you say to people who've been diagnosed with, with a, a structural issue and are working with practitioners about that? Well, um, just because one has a diagnosis of a structural issue doesn't mean that all the pain that they're having, here my train. I do. <laughs> I live near a train track. Uh, it doesn't mean that all the pain they're having uh, is actually due to the structural problem. Yeah. A lot of times you can be diagnosed with a structural mm -hmm. problem, but so what we're doing is we're investigating the pain, investigating it, looking at when it comes, when it goes, what turns it on, what turns it off, what triggers it. Uh, if we can uh, uh, you know, create it through imagination exercises or whatever, there's a variety of things that we can do to help really drill down and sort that out to 
uh, how much of the pain is actually structural or not. And so that's, that's a skill. And that's hard to do a lot of times for people on their own. It requires, I think, people like us who have a lot of experience in doing that. Because mm -hmm. it's, it, it's just oftentimes hard to sort out. Yeah. But I think it can be sorted out. And therefore, if some types of pain or some percentage of pain is more in the mind-body, you can work with that in our usual way. Mm -hmm. And the other way, yeah, I think we can, we can dampen down or uh, reduce uh, the uh, amplification of pain that's physically induced by using these kind of techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, we may not be able to make it go away completely though. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I have found that clinicians who aren't necessarily in our space of mind-body medicine are oftentimes quite open to the idea, especially as people are getting better. And so I routinely encourage people to talk to their other practitioners about what they're doing and tell them about the successes that they're having. And yeah. some, some clinicians will dismiss it, but a lot of them will be interested and want to know more. And, and will a lot of clinicians these days like know that there's a mind-body connection, but don't know the details of it. And so they're happy to hear from people who are having yeah. success. Yeah. Yeah, and they're ha oftentimes happy to have patients that they didn't know what to do with or were frustrated by mm -hmm. uh, yeah. find that they can get better. And it's, you know, it's, that's good news for any doctor. Yeah. Um, somebody asked about uh, pain scientists in other countries, Laura Mosley, David Butler, Mick Thacker. Any thoughts about any of their work? Oh, um, well, Lorimer, I always say Lorimer is a hero of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's done amazing work. He's, yeah. he's done a lot of fantastic research. I quote his research all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we've developed some things that he um, hasn't really gotten so much into. Uh, so I think the concepts that he's developed are, are critical and crucial and are a form of basis for our work. Um, but I also think that... Um, uh, it, it just adhering strictly to their model can be a little bit limiting sometimes for people with emotional things that are uh, in play uh, or, um, uh, you know, um, just other ways. I think they, they focus heavily on uh, uh, pain education Great. and... Uh, yeah kinesiophobia, which are great things, and we certainly are indebted to them for that. Yeah. Um, but I think we expanded it a little bit that can be helpful. Too. I do. And I do think the emotional work is so important. And I don't find it that that necessarily permeates some of what other people are doing. There's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of education, a lot of cognitive work, um, a lot of sort of physical therapy and getting people back to exercise and decreasing the fear of yeah. and but but I think the emotions are so so much a part of this and yeah it's a fun part for me to work with and yeah. you as well but I think it really makes a difference when people can um, tap into that kind of non non-linear non-thought side of yeah I'm we're, um, there's a woman that I saw today who had uh, pain in her hip, and when her husband touched her on the on her hip, mm -hmm. she had a lot of pain there. Yeah, like when they were sleeping. Mm -hmm. uh, but when she touched herself, she didn't have pain there. Yeah, and so you know, it's like, oh well, this you know, how how are we going to change this you know conditioned response? Well, you know, it's not just a conditioned response. There's an emotional component mm -hmm. <laughs> to her relationship with her husband. Yeah. And if you don't go into that, I, you know, I think you're kind of, you know, you can be missing the boat and thinking of it as just a conditioned right. response. So. Yeah. But we work, but then that's better now because we worked, I worked with her dealing with emotional issues related to her husband. Yeah. And that, and that has improved and he can now, and the symptom has improved as a result of their emotional relationship being better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good. And then last question here, just any thoughts about long-term pain? And so if pain's been there for decades, do you find that that takes any longer to work on than pain that's been there for a shorter amount of time? 
yeah, uh, yes and no. I mean, sometimes no, sometimes yes. It's, yeah. uh, I, I don't. I don't know that there's actually a, a strong correlation there. Because we've seen people with pain for 20, 30, 40 years get better in relatively short order. I, I was talking to a woman a couple, couple of months ago now, I guess. It was an amazing story. She's a, a nurse practitioner in an OBGYN practice. And uh, she'd seen a lot of women with chronic pelvic pain over the years and never knew what to do with them. And they're always really a difficult issue. And she herself this nurse practitioner got pelvic pain and then it became chronic at six months and she was freaking out. Mm -hmm. And uh, she happened, this is not a plug, but she did <laughs> happen to find my mm -hmm. book and she got better in, you know, like a couple of weeks. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. And then she was talking to some of her patients about it. And there was this 84 year old woman uh -huh. who had chronic pelvic pain for 26 years mm -hmm. come into her office and it was such a moving story. She, uh, th this woman, uh, this 80, 84 year old woman had had a flare of, of pelvic pain over the holidays. She had, she had been up and down the Eastern seaboard, seen amazing, so many doctors, done everything, tried everything, 26 years anyway. And uh, it was right before Christmas and this nurse practitioner said to her, you know, do you think anything was going on emotionally or stress wise, you know, when this flare occurred? And, and this woman said, you know, I always have Christmas at my house. I always have the holidays. And I, I put a lot into it. My whole family comes and I want them to know that I still got it, that I can still do it. Mm -hmm. I put a lot of pressure on myself and, mm -hmm. and I want to make it perfect. Yeah. And this nurse practitioner said, you know, you think maybe that might uh, be related to this, to this flare. And, and she started doing this, this, this kind of work and, and this woman was better in one week. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it was insane at 84 years old with 26 yeah. years of pain. So, yeah. you know, there's always those stories. People, <laughs> sometimes people hate those stories. because I know, I know. Because yeah. <laughs> they've been working like, on hey, it. Hey, yeah. that didn't happen to me. You know, yeah. I, I understand. Everybody's got their own timeline. Everybody's got their own journey. It's not yeah. a race. It's not a competition. It's yeah. being part yeah. of it and being you know, being kind to yourself, being okay with where you are. And I find sometimes like the more trauma that people have experienced um, in their past, the more trauma that's been associated with the pain as you go along, it can yeah. sometimes be slow and sometimes people have breakthroughs. But I think like lately, I've just been trying to encourage people to be, to be okay with where they are. You're yeah. at the right place. Yeah. In the journey. Yeah. If you're impatient, it's only going to make it take longer, unfortunately. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, all right. We've been going on for a long time tonight, but any last thoughts before we stop? I just want to say it's interesting that, you know, we put out this little, uh, you know, thing together and we've known each other a long time. We're great mm -hmm. friends and colleagues. Yeah. And you're the tall, you know, you're the tall, thin athletic one and I'm the short, kind of, you know, more dumpy one. And when I look at the picture. <laughs> We're the same size. I don't know. My face looks, is like thinner than you. Not that thin is yeah. good, but, you know, it's just so funny. Yeah. Uh, seeing our pictures together, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of like brothers from a different mother. In a I way. know. I know. But, uh, anyway, no, I, I, I just thank you for doing this. I thank Curable for doing this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and just kind of letting people know that there's always hope. There's always goodness that comes out of adversity. There's always hope. And, um, and you know, if we, if, if we can work together and care for each other and care for ourselves, you know, yeah, we'll be okay. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for being here tonight. It's sort of delightful for me to get to spend a couple hours with you and mm -hmm. talk about this and, and see you. And I'm, you know, so grateful for our friendship over the years and, uh, and our work together as well. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for Curable for uh, giving us the platform to do this. Howard, would you be up at some point for uh, live? Yeah, um, but what are we going to talk about? I know, we talked about everything. <laughs> we'll, to, we'll talk about the... We'll figure it out. My son the other day said, do you remember when sports were a thing, Dad? 
Yeah, right. Yeah, remember when when people hugged each other. <laughs> so um, anyway, so thank you for for being here and uh, and we're listening to us and being interested in this work. Um, I know that I am available for consultations for people. Um, Howard may be as well. Please, if you're interested, get in touch with our office. Um, as an added benefit, if you mention the curable, take another 10% off the price of an appointment. Yeah, uh, awesome. yep. uh, yeah I see people, I see people virtually if they live yeah. in Michigan. Yeah. Uh, I don't and, see, I don't see people virtually for office visits outside of Michigan, but I do answer questions on my emails. So. Yeah. And I've been seeing people since the, um, since the COVID crisis, we've been making a way to see people remotely, even if they're not in Illinois. So uh, if you're interested, just reach out to our office to do that. So thank you all for being with us tonight. Howard, thank you for being here and for sharing your wisdom. It's been delightful to be here with you. And I hope everybody continues to stay safe and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks, John. Take care. Welcome. Bye.